Hello everyone, welcome to the last and final segment of our Dare to Care. It's been a wonderful 12 days with all of you and we hope that everyone has learned something. As usual, do remember to upvote your questions by using the Q&A button so we can better filter questions. Check out the contest page as well. There are quite a few contests in there now and there are $20 Starbucks vouchers up for grabs. Uh, these vouchers are sponsored by our agency for integrated care, so do go have a look. For information, the platform will be live till 19 March, uh, 23,509 hours, so you can continue to explore events and booths during this period of time. Replays are available for all sessions. So in today's session, we are going to go through some real-life working scenarios for our physiotherapists, occupational therapists, medical social worker, and nursing colleagues in St. Luke's Elder Care. We will be playing two videos and there will be poll questions at the poll tab. So do go there to fill in your answers. In case you missed it, the poll tabs are right beside the Q&A tab. After the video, we shall have Q&A with the various panelists. So cool fact, some of the panelists here are also inside the videos. In our first video, we have our patient, Madam City, who has went for a knee replacement surgery and has been referred to St. Luke's Elder Care for her rehab program. Uh, Madam City is first visited by our community nurse at home, then goes to elder care residents at Amokyo for the physiotherapy. It's very interesting because uh, I was there for the shoot and when we were sourcing for talent volunteers for the video, we actually realized that Madam City did actually come to St. Luke for an actual knee replacement surgery. I think the fact that she volunteered really pays tribute to the work that St. Luke has done. I mean, if they do, didn't do something good there, I don't think she would have volunteered herself. Now, without further delay, let's watch the first video. So to recap, the first video is uh, what happens in, a, in community nursing and also physiotherapy at the center itself. Let's watch the first video. Hello, Madam City. Hi. My name is Naomi. I'm from St. Luke's Elder Care. Um, we are the home care team. So today I'm here to help you look at your leg wound okay. and then uh, redress it for you. Is oh. that okay? Okay. You take medic medication today already? Yep. Taken, huh? Okay, let me get my things ready first, huh? Can I just check your temperature and uh, blood pressure yeah. first? Sure, sure. Can, huh? Okay. Okay, very good. 36.8. Okay, just relax. 142 over 95. That seems alright for you. Let me get this clean. And then after that, you can proceed to lie down. And then um, I will do your leg dressing. Any pain lately in your legs? So far, no. No pain, ah? No pain. Okay. You're walking, everything okay? Yeah. Everything okay? Good. Very good. Okay. You want to lie down for me? Okay. Can? Thank you. Are you scared? A little bit. No need to scared la. No pain la. Very gentle. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me just prepare this. Your kids when your kids went to work already, yeah? Yeah, all go to work. Okay. Who cooks for you at home? My before my daughter my daughter before she go to work. Wow, you're very lucky, you know. <laughs> okay. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna br just bring your uh, pants up, okay? So okay. it exposes the wound and I'm gonna remove it. Okay. I'm gonna clean it. When I clean it feels a bit cold, okay, because there's saline water. Okay. okay. If I see there's nothing wrong with your wound, then um, I'll just put another clean dressing on. Okay, okay. Can. Okay, Madam City, bit cold, huh? Okay. Just gonna wash your wound. It looks fine. Any pain? No. Okay, very good. You've been doing your exercises, huh? Yes. 
I can see that you are keeping the wound nice and clean. Thank you. Make sure uh, when you mandi, no water gets in, okay? Yeah. Nicely done. Good job. Thank you. Madam Siti, it's all finished already. You want to sit up? Yeah. Can I help you? Sure. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. So, therapist coming to see you? Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, when the therapist come and see you, they will see how well you're walking. Okay. If it's all good, they will probably refer you to the Day Rehab Centre, DRC. Okay. Then, from then on, you will make your way down to the centre to do your exercises and rehab. Okay. okay? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'll Thank see you. you again. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good morning, Madam City. Hi, my name is Jin Ming. I'm the physiotherapist of San Diego Elder Care. So this is our day rehab center where you'll begin your rehab journey with us. Madam City, I'm gonna turn you in front. Okay, I'm gonna bring the chair forward a bit, all right? Okay, can you place your hands here? Okay. Well, I lock the machine. Okay, you can start stepping. Okay. How are you feeling? Good. Good. So this is our leg press machine. This machine will help you to strengthen both your legs. Okay, okay so now I need you to put your, both your feet on the stepper. Now I will set the weight for you. So what I need you to do now is straighten your right feet. Okay, now your left. Good job. Let's continue this for 10 times. How are you feeling? Yeah, good. So this is our leg curl machine. This machine will also help you to strengthen your legs. So you just need to relax. I'm going to increase the weight for you. Okay, so you need to bend your right leg. Okay, slowly relax. Now left. Okay, now we're going to repeat this for 10 times. Okay, well done, good job. Well done, Madam City, keep it up. Well done, Madam City. You have done a great job for the past three months and you have achieved all our goals. So now your rehab journey is complete with us and you are now safe enough to go back on your own. Thank you, Jingming, for helping me for the past three months. I'm glad that I can walk again. Thank you. You're welcome. So, hope you have enjoyed that first uh, video. So, the fan fact of the video is actually we are trying to simulate an actual learning journey where you uh, view real patients and you know real scenarios, although the patients are actually volunteers. Uh, that traffic light you see at the end is actually outside uh, SLEC Amokyo. I think it's a part of therapy that you know they ensure the patients or clients are they can walk properly on their own before they, they, they discharge them. So that's an actual thing that happens, the crossing of the road and all that sort of thing. So let me go and see what we have for our polls. So what are some important tasks to follow during home nursing? I think everyone got that correct. So checking patients' vital signs such as blood pressure and temperature. Uh, definitely not watching Disney Plus and all that. Lah. So question number two, knowledge of the allied health disciplines is important for community nursing. 90% of you uh, say it was true. Uh, ten percent say it depends. So knowledge is definitely true. I mean, it's definitely true for this, and I think you can see from the morning chat. Uh, they do work with each other quite a lot. Uh, so teamwork is important, and knowledge is also important. Uh, for example, you see uh the nurse manager, uh Naomi when she went for the nursing home visit, right? She has knowledge of uh you know therapies and so on, and and you know. 
uh, she's checking whether Madam City can walk properly, that sort of thing. So there's a bit of linkage, or rather I would say quite a lot of linkage, and it's quite important to... Uh, question three, physiotherapy patients usually take one or two sessions to be discharged from treatment. Uh, that is uh, not, that's actually not true. Uh, so 21.4% of you put true. So it's not a question of one or two sessions. In fact, uh, last time when I undergo my own physiotherapy, it took me months. And I think for the elders, it will take them much longer. So I think it will take at least a few months. If you see the video, it's three months. So yeah. I think very good all of you have been paying attention. Uh, so three questions are meant to be easy, but also meant to check whether you have understood the video. So now let's move on to the second video. In the second video, we have Uncle Peter, who has suffered a mild stroke. So Uncle Peter is referred to St. Luke's Elder Care for follow-up treatment. At St. Luke's, he is attended to by the occupational therapist and medical social worker. I think the med medical social worker is Judy, and she is in the panel later. You will be able to ask her questions. Let us have the second video, please. Hello. Hi, Dad. I'm so sorry that I called so late. Are you okay? I just found out from my dad that you had a stroke. Yes, uh, Noel. I had stroke and fell on my head. I thought I was dead for sure. But now I'm okay. My body is still very weak. Tomorrow, I'll be going to St. Luke Elder Care for a rehabilitation exercise. Okay. Um, I hope the rehabilitation is okay for you. I'll call you in a few days' time. You take care, okay? Yes, I will. Thank you so much uh, for checking on me, Noel. I love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, sorry. Take your time. Take your time. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to St. Luke Elder Care Centre. My name is Kyra. I'm your occupational therapist. Today, we'll be doing occupational therapy assessment and some exercises. How are you feeling today? Uh, better, better, but still weak. Still weak? Any giddiness? Uh, not so bad. Any pain anywhere? Just general weakness. General weakness, Yeah, huh? I don't feel good. Okay, can. Maybe you have a sit there. We take your temperature and your blood pressure first, lah. Okay. Okay, this way, please. Take your time to walk. <clears throat> don't rush. Doing well. Take your time. Okay, so basically my role is actually to see your day-to-day -day activity. For example, wearing clothes, wearing pants, going to shower and feed yourself. Maybe doing a bit of household chores or going out to actually be able to socialise with friends. Right? Okay, I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Uh, what kind of house do you stay in? I stay in the HDB flat. Oh, HDB. How many rooms is it? It's four rooms. Four room flat? Do you, is it a lift landing? Uh, yes, it's lift landing. That's excellent, lift landing. So, is there any steps into your house at the entrance? Yes, there's, there's one small step. One small step, lah, huh? Do you have any curbs into the toilet? Yes, there is one. There is one curb into the toilet. Is it a very high curb or a small curb? I don't know whether it's high or low. Maybe about uh, two inches. Two inches, lah. Is there any grab bars in the toilet? No, there no isn't. Bus, nah? Okay, we have this HDB is mm. program that is actually provide the subsidies of anti sleep flooring application and also grab bus application. So the grab bus can be installed inside the toilet bowl, near the toilet bowl area where you can hold on to get on and off the toilet. Okay, mm. it also can be installed outside the toilet so that you can hold on and cross the curb to go inside the toilet or they can be placed around your house to assist you when necessary. This is the brochure for you to have a look. This is our occupational therapy home safety advice. Just to ensure that if you have any rags or any cloths on the floor that sometimes you use to wipe your feet after coming up from toilet, try to remove it as it is a trip hazard. You might actually trip on it and fall down. 
Oh, okay. okay. Yes. Also, for the four precaution wife, make sure that you went, you go to the hospital regularly for your eyes checkup, and also when you get out for toilet in the middle of the night, ensure that there's a light, night light, in uh, case that you get a bit more giddy and you can't really see at night, affect your vision. The yeah. night light will actually assist you to prevent you from falling also. Okay. And I understand that now we use a lot of uh, electronic appliances. In case the cables is on the side, try to push it against the wall. It's also a trip hazard for you. We just want to ensure that you are safe at all times. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Welcome. So, this is our heat therapy. It will actually help you to receive some muscle tightness and also some pain. Lah. I'm just going to apply here for you. If you feel any pain or too hot for you, inform me immediately. Okay? How are you, sir? How are you feeling? Good. Good. <laughs> okay, if it's still hot, let me know. Okay, I'm just going to do some trigger release point uh, therapy for you to ensure that your muscle is not so tight. Lah, huh? How are you feeling? Mm, okay. Okay, lah, huh? It's a bit of tightness. Maybe we can later on I can teach you some exercises to do at home. Lah. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Is it very painful? A little oh. bit. A little bit, lah, huh? Is it here? Just gonna do a little bit of gentle massage for you. Uh, oh. uh, right now, when you wear clothes, do you need help with wearing clothes? Yeah, my wife dressed me up. Oh, you can't. You haven't wear it yourself yet. Oh, uh, it's very difficult because my arm is very restricted. I see. Okay. Would you like to learn how to wear your shirt yourself? I think that would be very helpful. That's great. Shall we practice that? Okay. So, okay. I have some button shirts right here. I'm just going to teach you how to wear, okay? Yeah. This is one set for you first. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have one set for myself. Firstly, orientate yourself to where the collar of the shirt is and where is the sleeve of the shirt. Okay. Okay. So you orientate where is the left hand side of your sleeve. Take your time. Good yeah, job. Yeah. That's very good. Okay. Using one hand, try to roll it up a little bit. And since your hand is in this restricted position, try to put it over your hand. Good job. Not so easy, yeah? Huh? Not so easy. Take your time. Relax your shoulder. Relax yourself. Can you reach into your sleeve? Good job! You've Thank done you. well. Thank you. It's a bit of a struggle, but practice comes perfect. So, okay. how are you coping with your day to day? A bit challenging at times. And then now, because of this condition, I cannot work. Do you have any other concerns? Every time I come here, I have to pay. And then I go to the hospital, I have to pay. And now, I cannot work, so I don't have income. We do have an MSW, a medical social worker on board that can actually advise you more on the financial schemes and aids. Is it alright for me to refer you to them? I'll be very happy to get help. Yes, they will advise you more on the financial assistance part. So I'll refer you to her. Thank, Thank you so much. Welcome. Huh? So Mr. Peter, you mentioned that you um, have no income currently and wife is a main caregiver at this point in time, right? Correct. So yes. even then she cannot work so much because she has mm. to stay home to look after me. Mm. Mm. Okay, okay. So currently after, what, what were you working before? I'm a taxi driver. Taxi driver. Yeah. Okay. It's not an easy job uh, being a taxi driver. Yeah, and mm. because of this condition, now I cannot drive because once my hands is, is very restricted. Sure, sure, sure. 
Right, right. I mean, of course, uh, at St. Luke, uh, I mean, for the rehab fee, uh, if you're worried about, we can actually help you with some financial assistance. Uh, that's for the rehab services. Uh, but I will need to understand a bit about uh, your family support. Uh, I also understand from Kara that you have a son as well. Um, yes, my boy mm -hmm. is actually uh, living in Australia, mm -hmm. so he's not here. Right. So I don't think he can help. Mm -hmm. Is he studying or working? He's studying. Oh, uh, okay, okay, right, right. So you used to be the main breadwinner at home, lah. Correct. I see, I see. It must have been affected your family quite badly, yeah? Yeah, that's okay. why it's very difficult. So Kyra told me that she'll refer me mm. to you. Mm. So I hope you can do something to help me out mm. in my current situation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peter, for your time. Uh, thanks so much for like, sharing about your issues at home. So just to wrap up today's session, uh, we talk about two aspects also. So number one is our financial concern for your rehab fee. So um, earlier session, we talked about uh, what are the available financial assistance that we can offer you. So in our next three months uh, uh, session with us, you don't have to worry on the uh, rehab fees. So that one uh, we'll review in about three months time. I'll check in with Kyra, uh, how, how do you progress for the next three months? So if there's a need for an extension, I'll see you in three months time. Is that all right with you? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, okay. So on the, the other aspect is uh, Zarek. Okay, so over in St. Luke, we also offer caregiver support. So usually post-stroke, we also want to check in on how caregiver is coping. So uh, I'm just going to share with you this form. Uh, if you may help, uh, please bring this form back to your wife to fill in. So this will allow us to check in on her coping, whether or not uh, how comfortable she, is she looking after you. So if let's say the score is high, my colleague, a counsellor will follow up with her. Is that, is that okay for you? Yes, thank you very much. I think she will appreciate your... <laughs> Okay, okay, great, great. So there are two expect, yeah? So it's the financial and also the caregiver follow-up. So if there's no other concern, uh, I'll see you again in three months' time. Okay, thank you so much. That's all for today. Thank you. Okay, so hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, poll questions. So I've been looking at the poll questions and very good. I think everyone has perfect scores. So for the first question, as an OT, you need to find out about the patient's background and surroundings. That's true. Second question is important to show empathy to patients and to journey with them when you're conducting therapy with them. That's also true. Uh, I think throughout the whole two videos, we can see uh, all the healthcare professionals, all the comcare professionals, they are giving a lot of empathy, showing a lot of empathy. Even like uh, certain things where, you know, we have uh, Uncle Peter who wore his shirt after the stroke, right? He gave out a shout of joy. So such things are very common for us. You know, we do it every day, but for them, you know, they lose that basic uh, ability, that basic thing that they, they do every day is very different for them. I think it's important to show that, you know, we are with them and we are actually journeying with them. So last question is caregiver support. So caregiver support is actually a key pillar in the rehab of patients. This is true. And I think I want to elaborate a bit here also because, uh, you know, I was actually there for the filming of the two videos, right? And I can see in the real setting, right, for the real patients that our PTs, OTs, they attend to, right? It's very important to have the caregiver involved. Uh, not only is it the family members, uh, when I was there, I see uh, the domestic helpers, uh, people who bring them there. They actually support the, 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 un the uncle or auntie quite a lot in the therapy sessions. It's important because some of these uncle and aunties, right? They cannot do basic things like uh, lift themselves up or cannot walk and they're very, very very weak in that sense that you know if it's their first time there or maybe second third time they're not familiar with the surroundings they find it very hard to actually do the therapy and so with the caregiver it actually helps quite a bit because they are used to someone uh, they know but it takes a lot of coaxing as well la. so for the PTOT that's working there that bond with the caregiver is very important that caregiver should know what uh, you're trying to do what you're trying to achieve is very, very important. I think 
when I was there, there was this uncle that needed help walking. I think there were a total of three or four of them supporting him in case he falls down, uh, that sort of thing. And I think it's 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 just very important that you know you involve the caregiver. So later we can ask our professionals and our panelists about the caregiving support. So that's it for the video segment. Uh, thank you for watching and participating. I'm sure everyone has questions for our panelists. Uh, before we go to them, right? I wanted to introduce them first. So we have uh, Naomi Chen, who is nurse manager. We have Christine Kong, who is physiotherapist. We have Felicia Lee, who is senior OT. We have Jodie Lee, who is a senior medical social worker. Now, before we get into the Q&A proper, I just wanted to ask the panelists a round of questions for a start. So the first question for Naomi is, for community nursing, independence and a certain rapport with patients is important. Uh, I noticed you were very bright, engaging, very pleasant. You also made Madam City feel comfortable by using the word of Malay. You know, you used uh, mandi, which is actually, I think, bathing in Malay or rather shower. Can you elaborate on how do you do it? And, you know, how do you go about establishing good rapport with them, especially those who might not be so willing to open up to you at the onset? Well, Nigel, your question very long. <laughs> okay, so essentially, right, um, uh, from the first visit, I think it's when you start to um, build up the rapport. So first impressions do count a lot. It's just like going for an interview, um, you know. So um, the first thing is to um, build up the, um, um, uh, the, a good impression with the, not just the, the elder, but also their family. Um, because um, the family is going to be your largest source of information especially if the elder has got dementia so then um, tone of voice is very important um, your body language is very important um, this is um, very much practiced here in uh, St. Luke's Elder Care as well so for all our new admissions and all that um, um, that's how we, we welcome them into their new home so um, it doesn't matter that they do not understand the language that you're, you're speaking in. But as long as the tone of voice is correct, your body language is correct, you're welcoming, um, that is how they uh, start feeling that, oh, okay, maybe I can just click with this person a bit, maybe just open a bit of a, a, a window and let this person in and then see what he or she has got to offer. So this is um, very uh, important uh, in um, all visits. And more so um, when you're um, having to handle um, elders with dementia. Because they don't understand you, but they can feel any animosity um, from you and any negativeness from you. So uh, that's why I always uh, try to, um, you know, have this kind of... Uh, a bit of a, a bit xiao xiao kind of um, personality with everybody. <laughs> My colleagues will tell you. So. <laughs> yeah, so that's that, that's for me. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, I agree, I agree also. So uh, I, I think I shared earlier in the morning in the chat, right? But I also have a grandfather with dementia in the past. So he passed on already. Uh, I try to cut the story short lah, huh? because his dementia is very interesting. So while well, people forget about things, right? He actually forget his present uh, life. So he actually thinks he's a child. So it's, she's like Benjamin Button like that. Like, if you watch the show, right? They As they age, then they get younger. So during his... So he has times where he breaks out as a child. Then during those times, right, he would like run around and think that the Japanese uh, war planes were going to get him, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, when he's like that, uh, nobody can reach out to him. Nobody. Because he will be very scared and he will just find shelter and hide somewhere. Sometimes we cannot find him also, although he's like quite large, like an adult. Lah, huh? So very challenging. Uh, the he's he was in a nursing home, I think Orange Valley. Uh I I wouldn't say like I pity the nursing home people, lah, but I really salute them for their their sacrifice because he's quite old, lah, but he can run quite fast. Lah. And you know, you because he's old, I think they cannot like sort of like grab him violently, that sort of thing. They sort of like try to gently, you know. So it's very tricky. And uh the thing is I realize 
when I talk to him, right, you need to be very sincere, very kind. And I, I didn't even know, I mean, even if you're a stranger or a healthcare professional working there, I didn't know why it was necessary to do this until, you know, when I spoke to him where he was uh, his regular self again. So he has this... Uh, uh, he has these uh, episodes. Lah. So I spoke to him. Then I, I spoke to him like, Hey, Akong. Uh, so I translated. I could have spoken in Hokkien. Why, why you... Uh, you know, when people... When you do this, then you don't recognize anyone. Then why do sometimes some stranger talk to you, you suddenly okay with them? And he told me something uh, very interesting. He just say, uh, I, uh, those people uh, that don't care about me uh, won't talk to me for a very long one. Those people that I know chasing me around all this one, uh, I somehow know that they are good people. <laughs> so after that, it struck a chord with me because it's quite true because I think in their uh, reality, in their treatment or in their face, uh, I don't know what they're going through in their, their head. They Actually, I think he based it on how long he sees that person and how hard that person is trying to get to him. So if he see that person trying to catch after him, la, trying to talk to him, la, he, he must know that he's a friend. La. I think that's how he actually sees things. Or maybe because in his, his episodes, he's actually like a kid. So he's like trying to gauge you, trying to see whether you offer help to him. Mm. So that is my sharing. Uh, a bit off topic, but I think the, the answer to that is really uh, to, to trust and to really uh, try and not be discouraged. I think early in the morning, someone, or rather in the morning, someone asked about <laughs> Uh, the language and whether you know how to communicate with these elderly people i think this is how you communicate and you don't even need to speak with words actually you just need to really show and really to hang in there and really in that period of time ensure that they do not uh, get into trouble or injuries lah. actually nigel if i may add on uh, sometimes <laughs> words um uh the words don't really matter to them um whereas uh you may add on touch touch therapy so um, they do respond to touch I love to touch people by the way yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah in the very clinical sense yes uh, yeah. so touch plays a very big role in engaging them and um, also gaining and gaining their trust and assuring them thank you Naomi yeah touch and sound so uh, my grandfather was into birds you know those uh, those you know bird pets. So we would like buy those kind of birds and, and bring it to him during the nursing home visits that we have. Then you know he touched the bird. Then you feel like a bit of wow, flashback. And those were very those were the precious times lah. So like very fun days. Okay, so uh, for Christine, so now we go to the PT aspect. Uh, I noticed Madam City's therapy equipment looked very high-tech and very new. I remember my own experience doing uh, physiotherapy 10 years ago and these machines, right, didn't exist. Could you share more about the machines and the equipments and how they actually support the work of PTs? Uh, were there any challenges in getting your clients to use these machines and how did you overcome them? Um, thanks for the question. Uh, so basically, these machines are quite new, I would say, like few years, it's been been rolled out at different centers and you'll start seeing it a bit more. Uh, so basically, um, when we have, when you incorporate technology with rehab, we can make it a little bit more targeted and precise and also safer for the elders. And it's also more self-enabling because in such machines, right, they have like a little dashboard which tells you how much you've done, how many more do you have left and how what's the weight or resistance that you're doing your exercise against. Uh, so they know what's going on and rather than like the usual old ones where it's just like they're just moving on their own and they don't have any feedback to let them know what's going on. Uh, so, and it's also, it's also fun for them in a way. So it's something new. Uh, so it, uh, they're always quite intrigued by technology. So <laughs> it's something interesting to get them to try and do. Uh, it also makes your sessions a bit more effective and efficient because these machines can sort of target um, specific movement range and specific different muscle groups and movements that are sometimes difficult to target when you don't have the support of the machine. So they can get the elders in positions that are a bit harder to get without the support of a machine. Um, yeah, so that's pretty good um, in a way to help build their strength and also their resistance against certain loads. 
Yeah. Uh, also, one good thing about these machines is that the load increment uh, can be preset and it's quite automated. So, and the increments are as low as like about 500 grams. So we can go accordingly to what the elders are like comfortable with and what they can tolerate. Yeah, and I think some of them also have a card that you can store your um, information on. So whenever they come, they can just tap. And they can actually, if they're mobile enough, they can go around and do their own machines um, because the information is stored on the card. Yeah, so it's very effective and very efficient. Huh? Yeah, and other than um, these kind of like machine machines, we also have been incorporating a lot of um, something called like video game kind of stuff, but not exactly video games, something like the Wii, but more suited for elders. Yeah, we call it, I think, Silver Fit. That one's also quite engaging because the elders, they get um, very excited and competitive when we incorporate games and like um, pictures and yeah, very real life kind of like VR kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so you're asking me some challenges as well, right? Getting them to use these machines. Uh, so the main thing we deal with it is we explain very clearly because it's something they've not seen before, obviously. Then we have to demonstrate it. We use the machines and then we show it to them how to get on. Some of them get, have a fear because it's like, oh, will I fall? Will this thing break under me? Or, you know, will I break the machine? Uh, so we demonstrate and reassure that it's safe and they will, nothing will happen to them. Then obviously we have to adjust the settings accordingly to what they can do at the start. So sometimes we start very, very easy. So just to show them how it goes, yeah. And then accordingly, we'll just increase the resistance or, or whatever needs to be done for them to have a better exercise session. Yeah, so it's a lot of um, encouragement as well, reassurance. Yeah, it's, it's same for us. Like, let's say you throw me somewhere and ask me to do something new, I'll be like, oh. but if you let me know what, is, what it is and what it's for, and why I'm doing this, then I'll be a bit more open to the idea of trying it. Yeah, sometimes we don't, we're not successful with all elders. Some of them just refuse to use these things. Yeah, <laughs> They prefer old school ways of things. So yeah, we just have to adapt to each elder's needs and preferences. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. Uh, for info to the audience, right, the machines, some of them are actually uh, using compressed air to, to, to set the settings. So I think it's quite important. Uh, especially if you know the weights are heavy and, and that sort of thing. It's not you're not working with you know those uh school screws with the weights and you must insert, take out, change the weights. It's all done with a touch of a button. Okay, uh so next question for Jody. Uh as part of your work as a MSW medical social worker, I noted that you uh check on your patients' caregiving support and network. Uh, that seems to be something very important in the comm setting. Can you share with us in greater detail what you do in this aspect and you know what what's a memorable experience so far other than the one you shared this morning? Okay. Uh well, thanks for this question. Uh we do okay, I don't do the okay, we use uh Zarik Burden screening tools, uh, but I don't administer the screening by myself. I uh, we work as a team, so my colleague from the center Bay services and home based services, they will administer the questions uh, using Zarik Burden's uh, tools. So we are looking at the stress level of our care burdens of the caregiver, uh, usually uh, post-stroke or caring for um, clients with uh, dementia. It can be quite a draining experience for them. So we use these tools to actually measure their um, level of um, burden. So any score above eight, a total score is 16. So if let's say you score eight and above, that shows that uh, you need some help here. Lah. So uh, usually my team will outreach to this caregiver. Uh, we start off with a call. Uh, my team, we have we have a team of social worker and counselor on board. So basically uh, we're checking with the client um, caregiver, uh, what are the stressors in their life. Uh, we will try to try it within internally. So if let's say predominantly is more care issue, then the social worker will anchor on the on the on the um, caregiver follow up. However, it's more like emotional support, a uh, coping. Then a counselor will come in. So again, our team we work we work as a team. So counselor will uh, check in more on emotional coping while we look at care caregiver support. Uh, Zari, as it, as it is, is not um, exactly, um, I mean, it's validated, but we do have cases like probably score zero, but, you know, um, caregiver just mask out and say that, oh, no, I'm okay, I'm doing fine, you know, I don't need support, that kind of stuff. But it is also very much reliant on our colleague at the center, our clinicians from the home-based services, they will tell us, hey, I think um, caregiver are 
honestly not doing very well, despite the Zari score could be less than eight, then we were checking with a call, you know, and find out what, what, what is the issue. So just like this morning, uh, I received the call. If I look at the Zari in the, in the, in the, in the client's file, the P file, uh, actually this caregiver that I shared this morning, um, cause his score is very low. It was just a, a point of four. So probably that doesn't suss out, hey, I think he's having some burden. So it is then and there when you respond, oh, wow, this is a case of crisis. That's why, uh, uh, you know, the work of social worker is so interesting because you had to handle crisis then and there uh, to support the caregiver. You have to ensure that you help to navigate the resources for this client, the caregiver, just to make sure that uh, you beef out the support system in place for the caregiver so that the journey of caregiver, uh, caregiver burden is very much reduced. So this is something that we work towards. Yeah. So I hope that answer your question, uh, Niger. Yep, totally. Uh, thank you, Jody. I mean, since we are on you now, right? Uh... You know, in the video, it, things went quite smoothly in that sense. Uh, in actual life, does it, is it always so smooth or is there like, is it more interesting? You want to share any example of interesting? Okay. I, I have caregiver who slammed door on me or so. So, uh, it is never smooth sailing, honestly, in Niger, uh, on the ground. Um, sometimes, um, because we want to take, like what my, my colleague Leiling shared, we want to take a more uh, preventive approach. We don't want to escalate uh, crisis, honestly. So we want to try to contain crisis as much as possible. But however, uh, when we know that hey, something is not quite right, uh, um, we have to manage because uh, um, sometimes it could be a case of also abuse. Uh, predominantly, for we, we receive a lot of referral, usually triggered from our colleague uh, from um, tender base. It could be a case of uh, client with dementia, the elder with dementia, and caregiver are honestly not coping. So you see, you start seeing like bruises there and there. So the telltale sign is we go to Zari and see hey, what's the score. So sometimes you may see, wow, the score is like wow, 16 over 16, it's like bingo, like that you hit the jackpot, you know. Then otherwise you will see score as low as five, four, but somehow uh, you start seeing some like bruises there and there. You have to know that hey, something is not quite right somewhere. You have to do a lot of verification, uh, uh, clarity work with your colleagues, you know, and also with the caregiver. Sometimes we don't want to such we don't want to use this uh, platform to penalize the caregiver. That is not our intent, but rather we want to see how to bring in the services to ensure client safety and to better support um, caregiver support system so that uh, it goes well hand in hand. Yeah, so it's more collaborative, la. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jody. Okay, let's move on to uh Felicia. So Felicia, for OTs helping patients to get back to their life, it's really very commendable. And we can all attest to this when we saw Uncle Peter wearing his shirt and he was very happy. Uh, can you elaborate like, you know, how these simple acts of daily living mean to the patients? Uh, can you share some memorable experiences? Um, I think the most memorable for this year um, would actually be that there was this one guy who has not showered for a whole year already. Um, I mean, not showered as in he hasn't actually gone to, to the toilet for showers. So this whole time, his family members have been in just sponging him in bed. But, um, you know, being, being a guy who really loves cleanliness, um, you know, we could see that he was actually really um, suffering lah, because... Uh, and then plus, he used to be a diver, so he loves water. So um, for this case, we really fought very hard to train the family members to um, be able to manage um, transfers um, out of the, the, the hospital bed into the commode. Um, we really taught them how to use the commode so that he's able to, um, we, we are able to wheel him into the toilet for showers. Yeah. And then, yeah, so, um, yeah, he, he was so touched at the end of the session that he cried because uh, he, it was, it's something that he really, really missed. Mm. But, uh, okay, sad stories aside. <laughs> yeah, um, actually for, for OT, uh, we, we use a lot of, um, we do a lot of uh, uh, 
prescription of assistive devices. So actually I have some with me here. I don't know if you all can see. Yeah, but you know, the thing about OT is that a lot of our, my clients will always tell me, uh, are you playing masak masak? <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. Actually, all the things are really very helpful. I don't know if y'all can see from the screen. There's actually like a suction at the end here. So it prevents the bowl from moving. And then, like I said just now, you know, this actually allows the food to not, you know, to not fall out of the bowl. And this is something else. Okay. So we teach them also that they can actually modify things at home on their own. So this is, this uh, thing that y'all see here is actually, um, uh, how should I say this is it is actually put around the 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 uh, aircon duct so that it, it can prevent it from losing cold yeah so I mean the, the the coolness so we can just slip this onto a fork and it's really a built up fork built up hole oh. yeah so it's really easy and it's so cheap and people throw it out so we we, we teach them um, simple ways like this to be able to modify their lives so that they can be independent. So that's what all that's what OT is all about, you know, um, helping clients to regain independence again. Yeah, and even things like this. I don't know if you can see. This is a uh, is actually a is actually a um, like a small contraption that you can add onto the chopsticks so that clients can use chopsticks again. And you'll be surprised to know how important this is to um, Chinese clients. Because actually all of them didn't think that they are able to use chopsticks again. And it's quite important because I, I mean, I like my noodles. Yeah. <laughs> you all <Yeah>. do. <laughs> uh, you too? Yeah. See? Yeah. All, can you imagine all the things that we cannot eat as Asians? Like, um, what's Mira uh, wonton mee. <sighs> yeah. So we help them be able to eat all this again. But of course, we tell them less salt, less, uh, yeah, la. <laughs> less oil, less sugar. Yeah. All these things. Mm. <laughs> Right. Do you, yes. So it seems we are on eating, right? So do you do you get like uh your Malay or Indian clients like uh you know they tend to enjoy eating with their hands? Do you hmm. do you like uh do OT for them also for these kind of things? Okay, I, I don't actually <laughs> just okay. a bit. <laughs> no, not everybody curious. picturing me holding the client's hand and getting to the food. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't do that. Yeah, okay. If let's say the clients really have difficulties doing that, we would see, you know, what we would assess what's the difficulty. Um, we would see them actually try to do it, try to eat um, maybe uh, nasi brani. And um, we'll see, is it because they have got insufficient grit or is it, you know, like uh, because they have got insufficient wrist extension? Um, is it because of weakness? Is it because of tightness? And when we work with them on a like um, during our therapy sessions, we will address those, and then we'll get them to eat um, with their hands again, and then we'll see whether they have improved in all these areas that we have worked on, and uh, see if they had if it um, improves their experience of eating like, with their hands, mm, something like that. Yeah. Thank you, Felicia, for sharing. Yeah, I think personally. When I see and I hear about you, you folks sharing about OT, it's really being a uh, simple enjoying the things that we have. Okay, uh, thank you for sharing, uh, panelists. Uh, now we will take some questions from the floor. So, for question, for first question, right? Uh, can we have Naomi? So the question is, may I ask how can one progress to an APN? in the community nursing setting. Thank Sorry, you. Uh, Nigel, you have to repeat the question again. Can't hear cause of the disturbances. Oh, right, right. Yeah, I think it's my winds very heavy today. Uh, so the question is, may I ask how can one progress to an APN in community nursing? Ah, APN in community nursing, huh? How much time have you got for me? A lot, a lot. We have a lot of time. So I think, uh, I mean, the question really stems from, you know, there's been a lot of spotlight on the, the acute nursing route. I think everyone really knows about the, the, the route in that sense, uh, APN, nurse educator, nurse manager. But I think community setting-wise, I think people are wondering, you know, how can I get there in the community setting? Hey, you all watch too much. I want to be an angel, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think there's upcoming one, right? I don't know whether you're, you guys are inside. Maybe. Okay. Hey. So APN, um, it depends on uh, what kind of uh, uh, career progression you want. Um, there are three different tracks. One is the clinical track, one is the um, educational track, and the other one is management. 
So um, APN is the clinical track. So um, as an APN, you will need to have a master's um, uh, as an, uh, to do your uh, APN and you will need to do a, a pharmacological course as well, um, which if I'm not wrong, is incorporated into the uh, master's program. Uh, so uh, uh, that I think is in N NUS. Uh, you will have to do your master's in NUS. Uh, I will have to say though, um, not this thing APN. I think APN is fantastic because I myself personally, I love the cl uh, clinical route because uh, I love um, hands-on. Um, but in, uh, I think Singapore is working towards um, empowering um, APNs uh, in, in like things like prescribing medication, uh, having their own clinic sessions and all that. Um, so um, I think in the, in the future, um, the, the, the outlook, the horizon of the um, APN um, profession is um, going to be much brighter. Um, seeing the way we are going um, now, because um, um, as an APN, you almost function like a doctor. So uh, you need to be empowered to do uh, much more things, uh, much more uh, clinical um, uh, diagnosis and things like that, prescribing um, more clinical um, skills, uh, you know. So depending on uh, what you specialize in as an APN. So if you are a community APN, um, a lot of times it uh, will be something to do with geriatrics and uh, dementia and things like that. So, um, so it's how 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 we can uh, um, empower our APNs further in the community um, with regards to things like that because with dementia I, there is not much clinical um, uh, procedures that you can do for dementia. I mean, what can you do? You can't like. Um, dig out the brain or something and, and, and you know take out the black um, the, the plaques in the brain you can't do things like that so it's it, we need to know how to curate that for um, APNs in the community so a lot of soft, soft skills come into place and um, a lot of personable skills will come into place so yes if you want to go down to the uh, go down the APN uh, route in Singapore you will have to do your master's yeah, but think properly. Uh, think properly of what uh, you want um, in your career first. Don't go down a route and then later think that it's not for you, and then you know you wasted time and and, and all. So um, during uh, your time as a student nurse, as as a newly graduated nurse, do think um, how you want your career to progress on. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Okay, another question for either Felicia or Christine. And I think we have uh, Yu Ching here also. So what is the apex position for PT and OT in the community care sector? Okay, so this is Yu Ching here. I'll take this question. Um, I'm the rehab head for SREC. So uh, I think people had this misconception thinking that if you work in the community sector as a therapist, there's no career path for you. But that's a misconception. Uh, Definitely we are going to the same clinical path or, or the career path lah, of any AHPs, uh, same as uh, in the hospital. For example, uh, in the allied health, we will have the four um, apex, lah, whether you are clinical, uh, educating, educator, research, or leadership. So i give us an example. Like if you're talking about clinical, uh, right now in our sector in SREC, we have a senior principal level therapist. And OT. And also, you can specialize in that area clinically, just like in APN, but you need to do your further studies, your postgraduate in that particular area. Is it geriatrics? Is it OT? Is it dementia care? And so on, and become a specialist in a, a clinician. Then, in terms of leadership track, uh, we also have, well, um, two director level. They're already leaders, you know, like Lei Ling is one of them. I have another who was a therapist before, but now is at that director level. So you could uh, move along that path uh, and all the way up uh, yeah, uh, as a leader. Then if uh, someone is very interested in research or education, they might further and we might support them and eventually they might go into faculty and teach. As well, my own, my own classmate who graduated together with me, he is now teaching uh, in SIT. 
Uh, my own fellow colleague who used to work with me, she is a chief adult health officer. Uh, so it's that kind of level of path that you could go all the way. There's no stopping you. Nigel, you're muted. Oops, sorry. So to add on, right, uh, I think there's also quite a lot of leadership that you need to do if you're awarded the Community Care Scholar. So I would not worry about uh, the career path, to be honest, uh, because whether you ha are going into any of the areas that Yuching talked about, whether a clinician, whether uh, whether educator or so on, right, you definitely need to show leadership in one way or another. And I think from the very fact that we have Yuching joining us and we have the team here, I, I think it, it really shows you the career paths available. I don't think it's going to be, you know, you join a, a nursing home or you join a CCO and then you're, you're just going to be there for, to become a clinician, for example. It's not like that. I think there's a very defined career path these days. And, you know, since we are on this, uh, touching back on uh, Naomi's point about the career paths also, I shared very early on in the whole event that, you know, nursing is a very different or rather allied health also, nursing and allied health are, are very different, uh, it's very different nowadays compared to last time during my poly days, right? Uh, when people talk about nursing, uh, it's like, oh, 27 points then can go in, I uh, better not go. Or you talk about, uh, is it PT last time? I think people are like, oh, you must study A-level, then I think go Nanyang or Nian Polytechnic, I think Nanyang. So it's very different these days. I think you look at the universities offered here, the courses offered here, you look at the levels that and the, you know you look at things like APN you you see here Naomi I think she's doing her master's in, in, in dementia care uh, it's very different it's very advanced in that sense it's not, it's not like last time where people you know only think that it's a very second job but it's not because you can see it here you need really need brains and you need a lot of other things to succeed in the job and it goes all the way down right uh, for nursing if you heard parliament last week right we had that debate or rather that spotlight on registered nurses i think they're asking for more career paths more developments for in, in that sense also so i think it's very, very different and i think you don't have to worry about the, the the career path or progression i think it's well taken care of and i think if you do your studies three years four years down from now right it will be even better so okay another question right and this one, I think any speakers can take. Uh, how do you know that the occupation is the one for you? Any heads up or advice for those who are keen? Go on, Jody. Wow, Sister Naomi Sabo. Ah. <laughs> okay, uh, I have no distinction answer to that. Uh, this is a million dollar question. Huh? So, um, but for me, I'm very clear. I why not nursing for me? Uh? I know I see blood, I faint. So this is totally up for me. <laughs> okay, uh, but I guess it really boils down to your heart. I I, I know I speak for myself, uh, and not for my team. But I, I guess it's really boils down to your heart, where your heart goes. Uh, I guess uh there are so many um uh, available career path profession in today's uh, world, you know, everything is so savvy, you know, just Google, you see what you want, you know. But I guess, um, um, I guess what is common in this uh, entire team here is, it's actually about um, uh, service, you know. Uh, if you have the instinct, inclination towards service, um, mankind, you know, whether elder care or children or whatever, you know, you know that you are, you are in the industry of health, then I must say healthcare is for you. Yeah. See, Nigel, I'm also helping you to sell Goyo. Uh. Yeah. So but I thank guess you, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I guess it's really um the 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 the, the, the inclinations to help. Um the humility also la. I, I guess uh not everyone is given the opportunities also. Uh having to journey with people at uh, their home environment is a privilege I must say because you enter their familiar environment. They could just close the door at you or they really literally slam the door at you. You know, but so it's just that uh, you have to remain um uh, humble and knock on the door and say, do you need our help? If not, we back off, you know, that kind of stuff. So you, you, it must be the heart of serve. Lah. If not, then don't even bother about this industry. I'm quite sure the nurses, um, my team of uh, therapists will, will conquer this statement. Lah. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jody. Okay, another question. So, I think you all are quite a fun bunch. So, you all, I think, will have a lot of answers for this question. <laughs> Do com care professionals get burned out when having to deal with some difficult patients for a long time? Do you all want to share? <laughs> okay, I share, I like, share this one. Uh, later, Naomi can add on if you have. Felicia as well, uh, you support me earlier as well. Okay, uh, so yes, we do get burnout. I uh, must be very real, we get burnout. Uh, like I say, no burnout means you're not into the profession, honestly. Um, because uh, when you're really putting your emotions, your feeling, your really your work in you know, your passion to work, really, you will face burnout. For me, I shared earlier in the morning, burnout for me, I experienced on my third year upon graduation. And I thought, uh, but you must know that when you're burnout, you know when to seek for help. And this is very important. So burnout is real, but knowing, having the insight to seek for help is very important to be sustainable in this uh, sector of help. Lah. Yeah. So uh, Naomi, you have anything on to add on? Jojo, I think you're really, very, really, very right. Um, burn out. Um, so, um, like setting up SLR, um, it, it is really a, a big job. Uh, uh, I don't think um, I'm experienced enough to actually set this up, but with a good team, uh, we work with each other and um, thank goodness um, it's all up and running now. Um, burnout is very real. You need to know how to actually deal with your burnout uh, what are your stresses? What are your distresses? And then uh, your stresses, you try and steer away when you know that it's getting too much. You need to have a close group of friends or colleagues. Like for us in uh, the home care team previously, we will have um, dessert Thursdays. Um, our our admin will <laughs> our admin will actually cook. Tang Sui, you know, for everybody. You know, we will have like steamboat sessions and all that. Even just one tiny lunch session to have steamboat with each other, you know, that actually just makes you go, ah, oh, like, okay, I have the energy now to continue again for another maybe five hours. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yes, I totally agree with Jody. You need to know when to stop, when to seek help, and uh, what is your trigger. Thank you, Naomi and Jody. Uh, I think it's a very valid question, and uh, as you know, future healthcare scholars, right? We do get a scholars who are very stressed, uh, very burnout, right? And time management is really the key, and it's very easy to say, but. Time management, uh, recognizing your burnout, seeking help. I think these are all very important. For me, right, last time, a few months ago, or rather early last year, right, when I was uh in I was attached to MOH for the COVID task force, right? I think we were working quite late in the night and I think I was on the verge of burnout. Uh my friends and family actually pointed out to me. So I think if you have friends or family around you, that also helps. My wife actually told me like, oh, you make coffee, uh, you're very strange. Uh. You make coffee, then later you stand there for like five minutes looking at your coffee. <laughs> then actually, then I realized, wow, I'm quite stoned. Uh. Then actually I told my wife, oh, okay, so sorry, so sorry. I mean, I didn't say so sorry. I said, oh, yeah, why like that? Uh. Then I, I really took a look at myself. Then I gave myself some rest, made sure I had enough sleep. So small things, uh, your friends and family will notice. And it's very important to also uh, have each other as colleagues, as, as teammates. I think when we were there filming the other day while wow, doing lunch, you can hear the, the hustle and bustle. You can hear the, I don't want to call it noise, like how I call it like recreation, recreation sounds. Sorry, I don't know what word to use now. A bit stuck. But yeah, so burnout is very real. And maybe I come to a question now since we are on the self, right? There are questions regarding the qualities that, you know, to possess if you want to take on a community care role. And there are also questions that ask, you know, uh, you know, about introvertness, you know, if I'm introvert, how do I work in the Comcast setting? So maybe anyone want to comment on this? Yeah, any introverts here? Definitely not me. Yes, <laughs> confirm. So <laughs> never ask you. Yeah, take the question. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Christine, I think first I am definitely an introvert by nature. I think they all know. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So why why can't an introvert work as a physiotherapist? Um, I don't think the issue is that. It's better you enjoy working with people and you try your best to overcome whatever you feel that is you need to break the boundaries in order to serve this person and make his or her life better. That's what I always uh, get into my mind. I've never looked at maybe what are my weakness, you know, or what I cannot do. I just try and see what the other person needs and therefore what I have based on my training and the experience that I have in this sector and I do I mean, give what I can give. Then if I can't do that part, I will refer to somebody else who has the skills to do it in order to progress a person further. Thank you, Ching. Christine, you want to add on? Um, not really, but uh, she was quite accurate on the point. <laughs> yeah, but basically, yeah, you just don't focus on your weakness, obviously. Um, if you're an introvert, what, what's wrong? Like, it's fine. Uh, so basically, it's just like how you talk to somebody, like let's say you're buying a drink from a coffee shop, you need to talk to the person, the uncle. So it's just it's just talking to somebody. You don't have to put it so scarily, like you know, it does, it's not so daunting. Yeah. So if you break it down and then it's just basically talking to a fellow human, yeah, it shouldn't be too scary. Yeah. So not to worry too much about that. Thank you, Christine. So I think we have introverts here in the setting. Uh so don't worry if you're introvert. Uh, you know, me myself, I'm an introvert, I am doing this here. Uh and that's the thing about introverts, right? We are very misunderstood. So I will share why. Uh, in the community nursing setting or maybe in the wards or in hospitals, right? Uh, we think that to be a nurse or a PT or OT or allied health professional, we need to be very extroverted. That is not true. We see the nurse as family, we go to hospital, right? We see the nurse, we share with them, ask them a lot of things. You think that there's a lot of people in that setting, but that's only for the visiting times. But for the other settings, right, it's going to be you and the patient alone. And I think when that setting comes to light, right, you and the patient alone, right, introverts are actually very, very, very good at listening and uh, doing this one-on-one -on -one time. So it's very different. So although we might struggle a bit in group settings, we might take longer to recover, right? When it comes to one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we are quite there. I don't want to say so much later. Naomi, say, say me. But yeah, so that debunks the whole thing about uh, this introvert thing, right? I think we have this question quite a lot during the whole two weeks, you know, asking, you know, introvert, how, how can I handle the setting? I don't think you have to worry at all. I think enjoy what you're doing and also look at the setting and, and just most importantly is enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, Mind you, I wouldn't dare yep. say you. I only meet la, you today, but already I love. <laughs> same here, same here. Yeah, I think the part about dementia really binds everyone together. Everyone that has been there has somehow, you know, know that sort of ground in that sense. But yes, I hope that answers the questions about the introvertness. So, okay, we have a bit more technical questions. Now, so one question is, how is the time allocated between serving patients and doing if improvement projects for PT and OT? So maybe you want to share, you know, the extra CCA. Uh, here again. So uh, I think this uh, quality project, uh, <laughs> see, I can see Felicia and Christine smiling. Well, we are all involved in it. I don't really see that as a CCA or extra. It's very much part of the core of our work. Because I say if I'm a clinician, I of course I want to make sure that the treatment that I give is as good as possible, as evidence-based, I call it. Maybe the fastest way and the shortest way and the cheapest way, and yet I can get the job done. So I need to continuously improve. So as I work, I need to test. If I find something new, I test again and I test and test. So it is very much in your blood as a clinician. So you 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 have to do it. Yeah. However, it will not be so much as maybe what 50, 50%. 50 no, I think by and large at the moment, at the moment in this sector, it is still primarily you're still dealing with patients. So maybe 75% is still patient care. But the next 25% is a lot of uh, administrative or ops, you know, operation kind of work. Like. You've got to get some QI projects out. You've got to do some a lot of paperwork. You have to advocate for a patient. You have to make referral. You have to do scheduling. You have to do assessment, monitoring, 
testing and so on. So these are 25%, one quarter of it is a lot of this administrative uh, work. Then later on, when you're doing QI projects, you realize that, hey, I'm, I actually enjoy doing research work. Then you might want to talk to your boss and say, hey, I'm quite good at this and I have interest in it. Slowly, if you show that um, affinity yeah, and the ability, of course, then we'll train you. And then maybe later on, you might you know, go on that path to be a researcher. Then, then the scope may be more, maybe be doing 30%, 40%. Eventually, be doing a big part of it is as a researcher when you have reached that stage. But that's how you find your interest. Good, Ching. Uh, can you share also how much or rather how many patients each PT takes during the three months? Like we saw during the video, right? A typical uh, patient for knee replacement surgery, for example. Like what is the load of the patients? You're talking about the load of the patient or the population answer two way. Huh? If I am a therapist in a community sector, I may be seeing less patients than I have to if I'm in a acute hospital. For example, I would be seeing 10 cases a day, 10 to 12. Actually, in our sector now, it's 12 uh, sessions or 12 patients a day. If I'm a PT coming for therapy sessions, it will depend because in a hospital, I might see a PT every day because I'm in the hospital. If I'm in a rehab hospital, I might see a therapist two times a day, you know, PT in the morning, and OT in the afternoon, so it's two sessions a day. But if I come to the community, I don't need that kind of frequency. I might be coming for two times a week. Uh, and then later on, if I get better and better, after two months, three months, I may reduce the frequency to once a week. And then if I can manage my own, uh, as assessed by the therapist, I will discharge after three months, four months, and maximally, maybe after six months, I should be able to discharge. Yeah. Thank you, Ching. I think Jody also shared in the morning session about the difference uh, between acute and com care. So if you're wondering, you can go and replay that session. I think she mentioned something about uh, seeing more patients in acute and then the, the aim is to get the patients out as soon as possible. But in acute, it's much more relational and longer. Okay, next question, which is for our OT for sure. Could there be more elaboration on the differences between OT and psychotherapies? Okay, um, I haven't had the privilege of um, really working with a psychotherapist. Um, but I think, um, actually, I've been seeing a lot of people ask us, what's the difference between <laughs> PT and OT? <laughs> can I answer that instead? Yes, yes, can. We have <laughs> actually, but we, yeah, we haven't answered yet because I think we're still building up the questions. Yeah, you can answer that also. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if I may, uh, Christine and Yu Cheng, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that uh, PTs, um, they, they generally use more exercise um, modalities. And uh, for OTs, we use a lot more activities. Um, and then OTs, we also use a lot more um, uh, ADLs based um, training for our clients. So we, we actually get them to do like you watched it, like um, all of you watching the video, the um, dressing, um, and of course also like I shared the feeding and um, you know, uh, showering. Um, and then um, just now, um, you all did see uh, that the PT took the, Ziming took the client out for um, community emulation. Yeah, so OTs also do that. Um, but then in the community, what we do is that uh, during the community integration, we will do things like money management, um, navigation to the environment to see whether they are able to uh, remember uh, how they came out or and, and what's the way back to the, the center or to their homes. Um, and then um, whether they're able to get back to um, their previous lifestyle, which is um, maybe if they're a housewife, maybe they can go marketing again, whether they can manage that load um, and, um, or like account money, whether they are able to take back the right change. Yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, so yeah, I think there's no perfect answer to that question because it has been asked a lot of times during these two weeks. Maybe I could trouble the person who asked that question, right? Go to the care to go beyond website, uh, go to MOH website and have a look. I think they have the official definitions there. 
But I do think in the Comcast setting, which is, I think, the focus, uh, their jobs are similar in the sense that they, they both work together with elderly to get, back, get them back to their best. I think that's the most important thing. The differences, of course, when you go to your university, you go to SIT, and so on and so forth, you can learn the more technical stuff there. Okay, there's another question. So the question is, will my exposure be limited if I join St. Luke's Elder Care for a new graduate? Would it be advisable to join the acute hospital first before joining Elder Care later on? Let me take this then. <laughs> um, for nursing, it depends on uh, what you want. Okay, if uh, you just want comp care and you know that comp care is all you want, nothing else in this world will ever entice you, then um, <laughs> that, uh, there shouldn't be a problem to uh, just come in uh, straight after graduation. But do bear in mind that uh, your learning curve may be quite steep. You will have to pick up things quite quickly. You will have to do a lot of reading on your own. Um, for me personally, I had um, acute experience first. Uh, so um, um, I feel that um, acute um, experience helped me um, when I'm doing my clinical decisions. Um, because, of, because when you're in the acute sector, you have got a stronger uh, support network there and you have got really good uh, state-of-the-art equipment and then all that you know um, doctors are just there in the wards and all that um, but yet again there is no point going to uh, uh, an acute setting when um, your mindset is not there to learn so wherever you are um, the mindset to learn is very important. So um, there is no hard and fast rule on whether or not you must get acute setting. I think it's um, uh, what you really want for yourself at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, I think the term exposure here is very, uh, you know, we usually look at exposure as in career opportunities. We usually look at the big and fancy things. But it's changing nowadays because if you realize, you know, the future of work, uh, technology, automation, these kind of things, the most important skill to have, I think one of the very important skills to have is to have the human touch, that uh, emotional uh, capacity, that empathy for people. And if you talk about exposure to those aspects, right, I think the Comcast sector can offer all of that for sure. Because we've heard from the speakers, right, and Naomi's example, for example. I think this sort of skills, right, I'm pretty sure you go to the Comcast setting, right, you work uh, one year there, right, you will come out a very different person. Very, very different, provided you go through all the grilling. Lah. So uh, Naomi in the morning says she got this very scary uh, sister or missy that, she very scared of, right? I think she might do the same next time to her juniors. Like, I'm not so sure about that. But you will definitely be a very different person one, two years later. I am sure the exposure in that sense will definitely help you. And to add on, right, I think community nursing, we do have, uh, I think, six months on the acute setting before we send you to elder care. So you're able to learn there also and apply what you learn. So don't let this uh, so-called uh, very straight mindset uh, rule you out from the Comcast setting. I think it's a very different world we live in these days. So automation and, and, and all that kind of thing. So I would add on that to the question. So uh, one more question for me actually. Will admissions officers consider on a case-by-case -case basis for individuals who do not score as well in the A-levels but have a strong portfolio and passion? So yes, we actually do a very holistic assessment of your uh, portfolio. So we look at results, we look at your CCA, volunteering, we look at your you know, passion, although it's quite hard to gauge passion in interview, but we, we, we can tell. And I think most importantly, we want to see whether you can contribute back to society. And I always tell myself this, right, or rather tell people this, it shouldn't be you asking about the scholarship opportunities and what it can give you, or rather what you can give back 
to the scholarship, what you can give back to the place you're serving at. So we look at these sort of qualities, very holistic, so not totally on grades. And so we come to opportunities, right? Uh, one question for the panelists here, are there shadowing, job shadowing opportunities and internships at St. Luke's Hospital or St. Luke's Nursing Home? Everybody is just quiet, so I suppose I have to take this question. <laughs> or is it the COVID situation? I guess that's quite... Yeah, it is really the throughout. COVID situation at this time because otherwise St. Luke's Elder Care is very open to taking uh, students, to um, bringing people in just to have a look around. Um, because currently, uh, when we recruit for St. Luke's um, Elder Care residents, the nursing home, um, successful candidates are actually um, coming in after having a COVID swap um, uh, to um, have a job attachment, to see that this is actually what they want. And so that when they actually begin their job, it's not a rude shock to them. Um, and then, you know, we'll be wasting their time, they'll be wasting our time. And then, you know, at the end of the day, the ones who suffer are the elders and also the rest of our staff. So uh, we have to think uh, on a very broad spectrum. Uh, that's why uh, we encourage people to come in. But um, like what you said, um, Nigel, because of COVID, right, we cannot really open our doors fully. Um, the door is just ajar at the moment. Uh, yeah, same here for our Q hospitals. Uh, I think the COVID situation has really disrupted things because I think the primary care or the focus is rather on the patients, the vaccinations and keeping the place safe uh, for the elders and the patients. Uh, but don't let that stop you. I think opportunities like uh, this one here, for example, or you can go learn about St. Luke's Elder Care in their uh, Facebook pages, online events, anything that you can get your hands on. I think if you look in that sense, right, uh, interviewers won't be too, I don't think we'll be too, you know, strict when people tell us like, oh, you know, that I couldn't find a vacation opportunity, I couldn't find an internship opportunity because, you know, now it's COVID. But rather, what did you do then that, that, that you did then that you couldn't find all these opportunities? Uh, I think I know of some people after all levels, they go hospital to work. So, I mean, those people that are really keen on the profession, they'll find any way and any way necessary to go and spy on the professions they want. And, and you know, I think my, my cousin or something like that, or nephew, they come from nephew, yeah, she went to the hospital to work because she wanted to see how the uh, AHPs there uh, work as. So she, I think she worked as a patient care coordinator or assistant, but during her free time, uh, she will go and ask around, go and ask everything in the whole hospital. So she's really trying to find out more about the job. And I think if you have this mindset, right, you definitely would be able to find something, one. Right? I think that's the most important. Okay, can I add, um, because I realize that this is something that a lot of students are very afraid of, um, as in, you know, being thrown into the deep end, not knowing um, what to expect. Um, actually, while we are going through our course, um, I mean, be it OT or PT, um, we also get to go out on clinicals. So that in itself is also an exposure. Yeah, so, um, and they don't just keep sending us back to the same place or, you know, it's not just a one-time thing. It, it, I think most of the time we have about like six, maybe five or six clinicals. And they try to expose, as in the lecturers or the schools try to expose us to as many different um, um, settings as possible. So they try to let us uh, try out PED, I mean pediatrics, which is working with kids. They try to, they, they allow us to work in uh, the Jerry uh, setting as well, working with elderly. Um, sometimes they let us uh, also do, uh, also work in the hospitals and then um, also in the community, sometimes even nursing homes. So, um, but the thing is, you know, it, it, there's no way we can be completely prepared. Yeah, because things are always changing. So, you know, I, I think we just learn along the way. La. Yeah. Can I just add on to that? Um, actually, schools teach you the essentials. You truly only learn how to function in your job when you're on the job itself. <laughs> 
I, th I don't know if the rest of my colleagues will agree. But yeah, school teach you the basics, the foundation. Um, and then you acquire the skills and the experience um, throughout your years of um, serving. Agree, totally agree with Naomi. Uh, I give a very quick example. You know, the, the dead bodies we see on TV, uh, you can see on TV very, you don't feel a thing. Uh. Then when I went to NTU, I visited one of the uh, bio labs where they have those dead bodies hanging on the, they have those cadavers. I think that's the term for it. What are very different. I tell you, I almost got the shock of my life. So <laughs> I think what you see and feel and what you do is going to be very, very different. Okay, a few more questions and we're at 3.30 already, so we'll take a few more questions and wrap up. So, question for Felicia. Uh, how do you learn about the different types of therapies to best support the patients? For example, touch therapy, music therapy. And I think in OT, there's also things like garden therapy. There's quite a lot of things, actually. Um, actually, yes, but there, there are causes for us to do. Um, but really, it's based on interest. So, I mean, for me, um, I've always been interested in um, gardening and um, art and craft in school. <laughs> so, when I, uh, when I heard that there is this profession that allows me to do all this, I was like, wow, jump on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, so far, um, therefore, I've been using this strength of mine to be able to, to get through to the clients who are also interested in this few. Um, 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 therapies la. but as, I mean these few modalities but uh, in terms of like music therapy wow, that one I really I, I, that one I cannot la. so that one I will not do with my clients la. <laughs> yeah um, but um, if let's say really have um, an interest in that area you know like a lot of people uh, how should I say uh, request for it I'm not so sure about touch therapy I've never really heard about that before um, but like <laughs> Um, if you really feel that that can help the client, we can actually also further our um, uh, our studies in that area as well. Yeah. Mm. Therapy, I think they heard Naomi's uh, sharing just now. So, yeah. Oh, I love pets also. So I do pet therapy as well. So there was a time when I brought my um, dog to work. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so my... my my dog went around, but my dog has been certified as a, a pet therapy dog. So oh, um, serious, ah, got such thing, ah. Yes, yes. There is this uh, association called the Therapy Dog uh, Society. Um, they actually uh, uh certify your dogs because um they have to make sure that the dogs, I mean the the dog is suitable for therapy with the clients, and that they, and they also have to make sure that the dog doesn't get too stressed out in the process of um giving therapy. Because some dogs can get very stressed out, you know, like, wow, well, so many people, different people stroking my head, you know, I don't like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, this is one area also. Like, mm, so, if anybody is interested in pets, your yeah, dogs can do pet therapy in future. You know, OT. <laughs> Thank you, Felicia. Uh, so, last week we also had the same question Do you have to be a master in all everything? I think no. So, the answer that was given, right, was that. You know, all these are uh, basic activities of living, activities of or activities of daily living. So they are very basic. Uh, you know, like cooking therapy, uh, music therapy. I don't think you are expected to learn Mozart or you're expected to cook the next best nasi lemak. No, so you are going to do things like, uh, trying to I don't know for music therapy maybe trying to play an instrument trying to you know for cooking probably how to use the spatula how to add salt, this, this kind of things. And I, I mean, if your therapist is a master of these sort of things, of good for you, like, you can learn something. But I, I don't think it's, it's necessary at all. Unless, of course, you know, you're doing speech therapy for a singer, then we'll have a bit chin, but I, I don't think that will happen regularly. Yeah, um, can I add, um, actually, um, this is something that a lot of, I mean, that my lecturers touched on in school also. Um, they said something about, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of times when we are doing a, a certain form of therapy for the clients, uh, we get very, very um, conscious and we get very, very uptight because we tend to think that everybody's, I mean, all eyes are on us. But actually, we have to remember that the objective is, you know, to help the clients. So it's not about um, whether we make the best uh, chicken rice 
or we you know are able to paint the most beautiful picture but it's more about like how do we get the clients you know back to be able to do all these things that they used to be able to do like maybe this client used to set up their own um chicken rice store and now you know you have enabled them to be able to go back and to do their trade that's that's more important so we have to take the focus away from ourselves yeah Thank you, Felicia. I, I know a community nurse that when she visits the home, right, the uncle auntie will actually bake a very, very nice cake for her almost every month and give it to her. So I think when they recovered, they remembered her. So it's really about how the clients, you know, get back to their, what they're good at. Uh, okay, another question. Do you guys work with SLT in St. Luke's? Uh, speech and language therapies? Yeah, yes, correct. Uh, Sandwich doesn't have a full time SLT for now, but in the home therapy, uh, when we need to, we refer to our partner and we buy service up from the SLT. We definitely make a referral there. Yeah. Okay, another question for Jody. What are the qualities needed to be a good medical social worker? Okay, um, <laughs> right. Uh, what it takes to be a good medical social worker. Um, okay, I, I guess what is important um, as a social worker, you need to enjoy face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, and also you need to be curious about the life of your elders. Uh, of course, having a, a good lis active li listening skill, being uh, empathetic, respectful, uh, it is important and also patient. Yeah, because you need to journey this with your client, you know, with the elders in the community, whether it is in a community or in the acute care, uh, you need patients. So sometimes you may want to throw in your intervention very fast. You do your assessment, then you throw in your intervention, your you know, your recommendation. Many a time you take you need to take a step back, whether or not your elder or your patient in the acute setting, are they ready for your uh, intervention. So I guess that's why um, patient is really a core essential attribute a medical social worker should have. So above all, I guess a medical social worker must come with a genuine heart to serve. Yeah. Thank you, Jody. Okay, so it's uh, going to be 340 already. We'll take one last question. Uh, so this question is for everybody, all the panelists here. Maybe you can answer, then uh, go to the next person. Uh, is there a particular care setting which you prefer to work in and why? Okay, now, since my, my mic is on, I can I answer this? Naomi, unless Naomi wants to take the mic. <laughs> okay, I think uh, I, I start first. Lah, huh? So uh, a particular care setting, I must say end of life care work is very, very close to my heart. And this is something that I really hope and build in uh, St. Luke Care. Uh, I'm appreciative for St. Luke. Uh, not that I want to sell St. Luke Elder Care Goyo, wah, but I must say they give me really uh, the opportunity to do what is of your interest. So uh, we try to build everything together. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, you try to piece everything together with the help of my colleagues, my team, my art therapy, my, my counselor. Um, I think uh, something that we want to build uh, within the organization is end of life work. So this is something that I hope that we can champion and make it happen, materialized, uh, especially in the area of advanced care, planning work, end of life, um, pain management work, psychosocial support. This is something that I hope to build within my team. Yeah. Naomi, next. You had to just do that, huh, Jojo? <laughs> um, for me, um, I am very happy in the residential care setting. It is my first love. Um, but uh, it's, it's because I get to, to journey with the um, elders all the way to the end. Yeah, I... Because I, I, I'm a very sentimental person. Um, if my patients uh, go home from the hospital, I feel a bit like something is missing, it's not right, and I don't get to see them again. Whereas in the residential care setting, I get to see them every day. 
uh, you know, accept the days that I'm off, but I know that I'm coming back to see them again. Uh, you know, then the feeling is there. Then when you step into the household, then, you know, they, they then they call you, then, then it's like, Hey, come and eat, come and eat, you know, right? Like, jia peng ah, jia peng ya, wu lim ko pi bo. <laughs> you know, then it really just feels like a home. This is this is my second home. Um, and I spend more time here than my own home. Uh, well, it's because it's set like setting up. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I really love uh, the care home, the nursing home setting. But on top of that, I would um, hope that uh, we can develop dementia care further um, nationwide. Because um, I think dementia, the people suffering with dementia um, are um, not well understood um, um, most times. You know, it's, uh, it's difficult to understand them because they cannot express themselves, but also difficult to understand them because they can get aggressive. And if someone's aggressive towards you, the natural response for you is to step back and then just leave them be. But actually, that's the last thing you should do. Um, there are a lot of ways to actually tackle or, or, or help them, um, help the people, uh, elders or people with dementia, uh, especially now when uh, we get more and more um, younger onset uh, of uh, dementia. So um, just a very simple thing like uh, playing music when you're doing a wound dressing for an elder with dementia. Oh, that helps a lot. But um, most of the time with a clinical mindset, you will just think, okay, my job is to go in, change the bandage, come out. But then you wouldn't think that, mm, okay, so how do, I, how do I do that and ensure that Mr. Tan is... Um, uh, cooperating with me so he's not so stressed up by, by the whole procedure and all that so that's why I say nursing um, the next lab it's um, really all about creative thinking and, and how you take things further go the extra mile and things like that a lot to do with soft skills not just your clinical skills thank you thank you Naomi maybe next Christine or Felicia um, okay, so uh, the particular care setting, um, home based would be what I'm like. Yeah, I prefer, and the particular type of patient maybe like stroke rehab, because uh, it's quite a lot that can work with um with a stroke client. Yeah, I'm being very specific now. Yeah, I mean I love all the clients that I see, elders that I see, but uh, sometimes stroke rehab because it's quite challenging so it makes you have to think out of the box uh, and see what you can do for them and also with stroke um, it's not just physical limitations there's also sometimes other things going on like um, they may not be thinking as they would without a stroke so you have to figure out how to go around it so it's just a lot of just trying to get around how they work and to get them back to a bit more of like what they can do for themselves yeah so and home base uh, because it's a new thing each time I go, so it's a bit more, not so boring. Uh, so you get a bit of uh, excitement that goes on. Yeah, and sometimes, yes, they do offer you food, uh, but they're very hard to say no. I try to say no, but <laughs> it's a bit, especially Chinese New Year, they'll force you to take, uh, I've made this cake, this jelly. Yeah, but you can see the genuine, like, they're all very nice people, very warm. Like, so you can see how a household like, is like. So it's quite nice to see when you enter into someone's house. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, um, I think I'm very privileged because I'm exactly where I want to be. Um, I'm doing a little bit of um, day rehab and a little bit of home therapy right now. So. I, I think I've got the best of both worlds. Um, like Christine said, you know, like uh, home therapy, <laughs> it, it's, it, there's never a dull day. Yeah, um, and it's always different. It's always um, interesting. There's never a boring moment. Yeah, but I mean, in the center also, we get to, you know, change, I mean, impact like many lives at the same time. I mean, unfortunately, in home therapy, because we have to travel from one place to another, we only get to, to work with at most five a day. Yeah. Um, 
But I mean, in the center, we can go all the way up to 15 or uh, 17 and 30, 50, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the more elderly, the more, the merrier, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm just, I mean, I, I think I've known uh, from, from school days uh, that I've always wanted to work with the elderly population. Um, you know, it's, it's, so this is, this is a dream come true for me. Yeah. I won't want to head any other way. Mm. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, you think how about you? I think you are quite senior. What keeps you going and which setting? Actually, the setting can change. Uh, you know, when the early days when I was a therapist, I definitely wanted to be in the acute. I wanted to do ICU, uh, orthopedic and so on because it's, it's fast, you know, a very fast pace and you uh, text to do uh, decision making and it, it works. I was like, oh, whatever I do today, tomorrow it got better very fast. But then many years down, then I realized that it, I gradually shifted like, my interest and I really like working in the rehab setting. So rehab is a little bit more slow paced, uh, you know, seeing stroke, uh, amputees, uh, hip injury and so on. And people take longer to recover. They stay months and months. Uh. So now at this point in my life, I think I really enjoy working in this, uh, I call it ILTC, Intermediate Long-Term Care, or you can call it Community Setting, and especially rehab, yeah. Because I really feel that I can make a difference uh, in, you know, when they have a physical impairment. As a physiotherapist, I, I can you know, improve your functional mobility uh, with what I've learned and I, how I teach you and empower you. And you, you, can, you can find, you can rediscover better like, how, to, how to function and how to find the meaning in life. So, and it's a lot more slow pace uh, for me. I, I really enjoy it now. Uh, and working with the relatives and caregivers. So, so I think right now it helped for me. Thank you, Ching. Uh, we have heard from all the panelists, and before we bid them farewell, right, I just want to add on this very short thing. And if you're considering a career in community care, right, I think you should really consider it because, uh, you know, when I was young, right, things weren't so, uh, things weren't the way they are now. But I'm only in my thirties, right, and when I look around me, my family members, my parents. They all have issues, medical issues and a lot of issues. And I think this will get worse as, as time goes along. As you as you you know, you're now probably A level diploma, so maybe in your 19 or 20, but in 10 years' time you're going to face a lot of issues. And I think this is where the younger workforce really step in and make a very big difference to our community care seniors. So without further delay, uh we have come to the end of this session. Thank you, uh, panelists from St. Luke's Elder Care for your time and your sharing. Uh, you can take your leave now. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, MOHH. Thank you, AIC. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Please join us. Yep. yep. So to the audience, uh, please take a few seconds to read this program at the bottom left of your screen. This is the last live event that we have. It has been a great 12 days learning and engaging together with all of you. The team at MOHH Healthcare Scholarships would like to say thank you from the very bottom of our hearts. Uh, to help us, we would appreciate if you could help us fill up the post-event survey that we'll be sending to you. Please note that the platform will be open till 19 March, 2359 hours. You can still come in and watch the replay replays of all our sessions. We also have ongoing contests for all the prize winners. The team will contact you in the next few days uh, or the next few weeks to have them arranged for you. Uh, reminder also, applications are open at the moment. You can go on to our website at www.healthcarescholarships.sg for more information. Applications close on 31st March 2021. It has been great here uh, and thank you once again for your time in the last 12 days. Uh, this is Nigel and I am signing off. Bye-bye.